very much for inviting me to speak in favor of quantitative tissue characterization techniques using CMR. In this talk, I'm going to primarily focus on T1 mapping, for the reason being that T2 star already enjoys its clinical prime time. For T2 mapping, we have an excellent evidence for detection of myocardial edema, whereas for T1 mapping, we continue to go through the motions of pro and con and how and why. In this talk, I hope I'm going to be able to construct a convincing case that T1 mapping is also nearing its clinical prime time. But first things first, why are QTCs at all important? There is an urgent need for better non-invasive diagnostic tools that are applicable in subclinical stage of disease, supporting early diagnosis. We also need to improve our understanding of the pathophysiology of many diseases, their natural course as well as disease stages, so that we can map out the opportunities for reversibility and improve the efficacy of our therapeutic interventions. In practical terms, what does this mean? This is how we traditionally understand cardiology patients. They have to present with symptoms. And not just any symptoms, but typical symptoms. This mindset is obviously modeled on a case of ischemic heart disease, where the onset of symptoms fairly well corresponds with the time point of myocardial injury. And when in doubt, we have an excellent non-invasive diagnostic test at hand. This has also transpired to be the optimal timing for the intervention, leading to reduced scar burden and together with anti-remodeling therapies, reduced remodeling, altogether bringing about a success story of improved outcome. In non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, the story is very different. Symptoms come at the very end of pathophysiological pathway after years and decades of subclinical disease. Symptoms, when present, are nonspecific, forcing the frustrated physicians in a cycle of repetitive investigations, which are known to have low diagnostic yield in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Once in a heart failure and under consideration for device therapy, they receive CMR and also the diagnosis. There is not much more to add to emphasize that this paradigm to diagnosis and treatment in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies has to change. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where quantitative tissue characterization techniques can make a world of difference. T1 mapping is ready for clinical applications based on its convincing clinical data that validates its role as a diagnostic test and a clinical biomarker, as well as the evidence that it is superior to the currently available clinical alternatives, as well as the evidence that it is superior to the currently available clinical alternatives. However, there is also a need for a necessary understanding of the technical state of art, including its limitations, which have to be observed in order to deliver the published evidence also in clinical setting. T1 mapping is quantifiable tissue characterization. This means it yields a number, which is derived by registration of recovery of longitudinal magnetization. T1 values relate to the intrinsic tissue properties, including the presence and severity of disease, and give clinical messages just like any other quantitative diagnostic test, for instance, troponin. Whether the values are normal or abnormal, whether the test is negative or positive for a certain condition, whether the disease is mild, moderate or severe, or whether the patients are at low or high risk of an adverse outcome. In a technically active field, we now have several T1 mapping sequences, and unfortunately, we need to come to terms that every sequence is a different diagnostic test. One way of differentiating between them is by way of T1 accuracy. Perhaps more clinically relevant is their clinical performance in terms of discrimination between health and disease, that is, their diagnostic accuracy. Different diagnostic performance is today understood in terms of their water sensitivity, their susceptibility to T2 errors, or perhaps, better put, advantages, comfort to those sequences with higher flip angles, as well as susceptibility to the effects of demagnetization transfer, and with both effects leading to a higher precision of measurement. These differences are considerable, 
making the evidence not interchangeable between various sequences. We also have to accept that prior to any clinical use, T1 mapping sequence has to undergo biomarker qualification pathway, where we ascertain whether the T1 mapping sequence can measure accurately, that is, by way of interstudy reproducibility. We need to determine normal ranges as well as limits of detection. We need to establish correlation to the proposed disease models, that is, by way of histological validation, evidence in model diseases, as well as outcome studies. And finally, we need to define the context of proposed use, that is, the clinical setting where this diagnostic test provides unequivocal, that is, clean and clear, clinical messages. And this is just an example of work that we have done based on a sequence as well as a version of scanner software, and where considerable amount of evidence is based on the multicenter data. T1 mapping is ready for clinical applications in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies because it can support characterization of subclinical disease, activity of disease, as well as risk stratification. In order to characterize subclinical disease, we had to first define the performance of T1 mapping in overt disease. In these two nearly contemporaneous publications, ourselves and others have reassuringly shown that T1 mapping indices are able to separate between normal and abnormal myocardium with high diagnostic accuracy. We have taken this further in the context of two clinical scenarios. First, in the context of hypertrophic cardiac conditions, where the presence of diffuse disease in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be separated by means of T1 mapping from predominantly normal myocardium in hypertensive cardiomyopathy, which can be particularly challenging in the absence of late gadolinium enhancement. In HCM gene carriers, we were able to show that T1 mapping indices are able to detect the presence of diffuse disease in our hands only with native T1, however other groups have shown similar for ECV and post-contrast T1 and related it to the underlying fibrotic phenotype. Further evidence for characterization of subclinical disease comes from the area of systemic inflammatory conditions, such as in systemic lupus erythematosus, T1 mapping indices were able to discern the presence of abnormal myocardium, which went undetected by traditional measures of function, as well as was superior to longitudinal strain, a recently promoted marker of subclinical disease by echocardiography. There is a further substantial body of evidence supporting characterization of subclinical disease by means of T1 mapping indices. For activity of disease, there is no better model than myocarditis. In this early evidence from Vanessa Ferreira, T1 mapping was able to discern myocardial edema over and above traditional T2-weighted imaging. We have found something similar in our collective of patients with the clinical diagnosis of myocarditis. However, after sorting them according to the time from their original presentation to their CMI study, we've observed a trend of declining native T1 values with time, whereby the patients with serial scans were closely followed by those that only underwent a study at a single time point. Guided by the existing knowledge on histological changes with time, we examined the performance of T1 mapping indices in acute myocarditis versus chronic or convalescent stage of disease. We found that in acute myocarditis, all patients had abnormal native T1. Not only that, a considerable majority, that is, more than 90% of all patients, had very, very high T1 values, more than 5 standard deviations above the mean of the normal range, leading us to propose this as a diagnostic criterion for acute myocarditis. Patients in convalescence had much more diverse imaging readouts. Native T1 might be normal or abnormal, indicating persistent inflammation, and they might or might not have a residual late gadolinium enhancement. In this study, the authors investigated concordance between histological evidence of myocardial inflammation and quantitative tissue characterization techniques, 
showing that native T1 and native T2 fared fairly well in patients with acute symptoms, whereas in those in chronic symptoms only native T2 was able to discern the presence of myocardial inflammation. In neither of the two groups, Lake Lewis criteria were found helpful. And finally, T1 mapping relates to prognosis and can support risk stratification in non-ischemic dilative cardiomyopathy. In a recent multicenter study of 637 patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, we've shown that T1 mapping indices as markers of diffuse myocardial disease are better placed to inform on prognosis compared to the markers of regional myocardial disease, myocardial function and structure, as well as the clinical scores. In this study, native T1 was independent predictor of outcome. So how can we use this knowledge in everyday risk stratification of patients? Patients with dilated cardiomyopathy and normal native T1 have good prognosis, whereas in patients with abnormal native T1, their risk of adverse outcome increases with severity of disease. In line with previous studies, the presence of late gadolinium enhancement is a marker of poor prognosis, whereas absence of late gadolinium enhancement is per se less reassuring. There is compelling evidence for clinical utility of T1 mapping in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies with regards to its diagnostic role in a variety of conditions, its ability to detect subclinical disease, to inform on activity of disease, as well as to support risk stratification. We need to accept the need for sequence standardization pathways. That is a compilation of sequence-specific evidence outlining its performance as a clinical diagnostic test. I would like to acknowledge a number of people that have supported this work and thank you very much for your attention.